Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So the end of 2020 is fast approaching and what an interesting tumultuous year it has been. I'm sure a lot of us will be pleased to see the back of it. But in the spirit of the new year and new beginnings, I thought it could be interesting to talk about my beginnings in this sometimes wonderful, often indigestible world of political commentary. The reason I want to talk about it is because my origin story, so to speak, often gets twisted by my detractors to paint me as someone who used to be a left-wing feminist but started doing conservative commentary when I apparently realized I could make more money as a conservative commentator than a feminist writer. These archives show Daisy Cousins used to write pop feminism. Being a boy suck pays more, I guess. Well, let me tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. But before I elaborate, this video is sponsored by slug.com. But when I say sponsored by, I mean I have to use that terminology because YouTube will get me into trouble if I do not. Really what I'm saying is that I am on a new pro free speech platform called Slug. I would love for you all to join me there and become a member of my group. Slug is a discussion platform outside of big tech, which is very, very important. And as well as me, it features a number of the content creators that you know and love. I have put the link to slug.com in the video description. Please, please click on it and join me there. I would love to have you. On the allegation that I used to be left wing, absolute rubbish. I've always been openly right wing. When I was 15 years old, I literally used to walk around my high school wearing a lanyard around my neck that said, proud supporter of President George W. Bush. I would like to state for the record that I have 150% rescinded all my support for George W. long ago, but when I was 15 and didn't know much about the ins and outs of politics, you know, he, he seemed pretty cool. Damn. Laura? Laura? Laura! I have always believed in low taxes, small government, and self-sufficiency. Tax has always been my vote-winning issue. Even when I was like 19 and at university and working a casual job and not making enough money annually to even be taxed on it, I would still always vote for whoever was going to tax me less. As time went on and as I grew somewhat more politically aware, that affinity continued. Anybody who knew me or was friends with me on Facebook between about 2012 and 2014 can attest to my stoic and often doggedly aggressive support of Australia's Conservative Party, which is called the Liberal Party, just so you Americans don't get confused, and Australia Liberal Party is the Conservative Party. I have never, ever, ever called myself left-wing. I have always called myself a conservative, and even when I was like a baby conservative with very little knowledge of the culture war, I was still able to recognize the regressive left, their moralizing, their disdain for anyone who disagreed with them, and their willful ignorance of facts, along with their tendency to gang up on people and accuse their opponents of things that they themselves are guilty of. I didn't quite know what to call that political faction at the time, but I would do battle with them constantly and got to know the type very, very well. So how do these opponents of mine, most of whom are feminists, get the impression that I'm actually a closet lefty who simply flipped sides because I thought I could make more money as a conservative writer? Well, it's because for a period of about eight months in 2015 to 2016, I did call myself a feminist. And I did this while working at an online women's lifestyle magazine, which was my first professional writing gig. Now. I wholeheartedly believed I was a feminist back then because this was before I had any knowledge of the culture war or identity politics or, you know, anything like that. I still hadn't heard the terms regressive left or SJW back then, although I was very soon to encounter them. So to me, feminism still simply meant equality equality between men and women. I was, and still am, an equality feminist, as are most people. However, as a conservative, my notion of equality was equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome, and I had not yet realized that the modern feminist movement had swapped the former for the latter while still pretending that they were for the former. And so it came to pass that while I worked for this women's lifestyle magazine, writing primarily about lipstick lifestyle and sex, of course, as one does at that kind of publication, I finally came into contact with the feminist blogs and websites like Jezebel, Mamma Mia, etc. that seduce so many young women, no matter their wherewithal, into the world of identity politics and the oppressor versus the oppressed narrative. Now, while this women's magazine wasn't specifically a feminist or political website, 
a bit of girl power simply comes with the territory, of course. I mean, it's a publication for women. And so amidst all my articles about lipstick, lifestyle, and sex, I wrote the odd piece that would very well be described as third wave feminist territory. Some of these articles I was commissioned to write, including from which perspective I should write it, even if I maybe didn't fully agree with it. But look, my job description was to write three 800 word articles a day for what I see now was very little money, but for a first gig I was pleased with it. All of which were set out at the start of the week in collaboration between me and my editor. Basically, I was the equivalent of a monkey at a typewriter. This is a thousand monkeys working at a thousand typewriters. Soon, they'll have written the greatest novel known to man. You stupid monkey! <laughs> you shut up. But again, first gig. I was lucky to have it, and I certainly was not complaining. It was more money than I had ever made at my various casual day jobs, that is for sure. Now, these weren't the ragey kind of feminist articles, but the more I researched my topics using sites like Jezebel etc, some of which I was directed to by my co-workers as good places to get information from, oh boy, the ragier I felt. And this is how pervasive third and fourth wave ve we feminism are in popular culture, that they can seep into the psyche of someone who was always conservative, simply because the messaging is so normalized. It's everywhere, and since it is everywhere, and was then as well, I simply never had any kind of real counterpoint. I was still floating around the theatre industry at that time, and all of my friends were SJWs, most of which actually won't speak to me anymore since I embarked on this conservative journey. I guess they weren't real friends now, were they? But either way, while I could easily mull over fiscal conservatism, why immigration rates should be low, plus the immigration crisis in Europe that had really taken off around then, the dangers of Islamic extremism, all of those shared concerns of the right, because I knew where to look for that information, when it came to feminism specifically, it was just so normalized for me and becoming increasingly so, that I just didn't think it was anything out of the ordinary. Now that didn't mean I didn't have my suspicions. I was always skeptical of the gender pay gap. I just couldn't get my head around the notion that in the 21st century, employers could somehow get away with paying women less than men for the same work. That seemed to me ridiculous. And of course, as I now know, I was right, it is. I was also suspicious of things like manspreading and mansplaining. I mean, they seemed to me a little bit petty, and certainly not in line with my feminist concerns, which tended to focus on the plight of women in the Middle East and what ISIS was doing to the Yazidis. You know, real stuff. However, I was still sucked in by feminist commentary on things like rape culture and sexual harassment and that genre of feminism because it inherently casts women as victims. And a victim mentality is enormously seductive because it insulates you from criticism and gives you the goal to say things that you believe others can't or shouldn't say. There is enormous power in being a victim, ironically, and it is very easy to fall into that trap, particularly as a young person trying out new ideas in a new environment. I was also then the, under the impression at the time that you could be conservative and a feminist. I was perfectly happy to call myself a conservative feminist. But I realized later that you can't be that, at least not in the way these modern feminists live out feminism. Their take on it is completely in line with far left, big government, collectivist, individual rights come second to those of the group, etc, etc, all of that. Totally at odds with the conservative mantra of freedom, individualism, small government, personal responsibility, and being a self-made individual, so to speak. I did not fully realize that at the time, although I had started to. Another wholly disappointing reason I found that you can't be conservative and a feminist is because conservative women are simply not welcome within the ranks of feminists. They kicked us out ages ago because for some reason they think the right hasn't changed since the 1950s. They insist that we're capitulating to the patriarchy, as they call it, when in reality, by their own standards, we're actually sticking it to the patriarchy. Conservative women advocate against the idea that a bureaucratic body, which is made up of mostly men, the government, that is, should have lots of power over our lives. We think that women can and should stand on their own two feet and not be beholden to the teat of the nanny state and thus under the thumb of mostly men. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I left that women's magazine not on good terms for various reasons, which weren't my fault, but whatever. So, in answer to that feminist accusation that I was a feminist who switched to conservative commentary for the money and grift, 
When I left at my job at that women's magazine, I took a 100% pay cut. I had to take on extra shifts at my mindless but reasonably paid day jobs, plural, and I did not start writing regularly for conservative publications until mid-2016. From mid-2016 to late 2018, so nearly two and a half years, I did not get paid a cent for any conservative commentary for a conservative outlet that I produced, that is, articles, speeches, YouTube and TV, all four mediums that I am engaged in. The only piece of writing I got paid for in that time period, which was 250 bucks for 100 words, which in Riderland is what you call kind of middling muddy, it's not bad at all, was for a women's magazine, which had a reputation for being a notorious feminist blog called Mamma Mia. I mentioned it earlier in this video. It was an article debunking the gender pay gap, which the magazine allowed in because it was just after the 2016 election when all these lefty publications were having an existential crisis and tried to get a wider variety of perspectives in for about two months, that is. They went back to their old habits very quickly. As such, I did everything for free, everything, for two and a half years. I literally had two faces. One face was the emerging television personality, columnist, Twitter person, eventually YouTube person. People couldn't really define me for a while there, living this seemingly glamorous existence. But the other face was the casual employee working two day jobs with zero disposable income and barely able to afford living out of home in Sydney. Side note, by the way, Sydney is very expensive, young people. Take my advice, don't move there. You will not be able to afford it, and it's one of the reasons that I don't live there anymore. Finally, in late 2018, I started getting paid for my YouTube videos after my channel got monetized. Then I started getting paid for TV, having done the hard yards as the new girl, which you have to do in TV land. I am not complaining about it. It sorts the men from the boys, and if you stick at it, then you are rewarded. I also started getting paid for a few articles, and also, most pointedly, all you lovely people came along with your wonderful support on Subscribestar and via PayPal and via your super chats in my live streams, which combined are the cornerstone that enables me to finally do this as my full-time job. Thank you all, I am eternally grateful. So, very long story short, the allegation that I somehow did an ideological flip because there's apparently more money in conservative commentary than a feminist commentary, and that I am somehow a grifter or a gold digger is demonstrably false. If I were a grifter who just wanted money, I would have continued with the feminist commentary and worked for more women's publications. I mean, I have the CV. I wrote about 300 articles for my old employer. Left-wing media is where the regular money is, believe me, because so many publications are left-wing, even if they pose as centrists as so many of them do. Anyway, thank you all for listening to my little spiel, rant, whatever you want to call it. I appreciate the opportunity to set the record straight on a few things, and I hope you now have a better idea of my origin story. Have a wonderful Christmas and a glorious new year. Here's to 2021. May it be much, much better than 2020. If you like that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me. Mm -hmm.